okay. Uh, just let me get some stuff set up here. Let me know if you can hear me, okay. Well, I mean, um, uh, we don't have too many people here at the moment, but I invite you, you know, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and uh, ask away. Um, my agenda is probably, um, is all review today. So kind of normally at the end of one of our five units here after we've taken our test, um, I probably go over the test um, and also the, the first, the the program assignment as well. So, so as a reminder, um, I know sometimes some students um, actually don't know about this, but uh, you can review your quizzes and the feedback or the tests, um, as I call them. So, I mean, I, th I think maybe I should go to the student view here. Yeah. Um, I think that um, if you go to activities, you know, quizzes, if you don't know how to do this, I mean, and, and you really should review your quizzes and things. And if you click on the quiz, uh, there should be like a pull down here, which gives you the ability to look at um, your submission review. Um, so I don't know if you see exactly the same thing here, but um, uh, I, or you should see something different if you've taken the, the quiz. You should be able to find your attempt and then review your answers with the correct answers and maybe feedback that I might have given, that kind of thing. So, all right. So you should look there. Um, although I will also post kind of a discussion of the short answer. So, I mean, you know, I've got some pretty big classes this semester, including operating systems. So I might not be able to give really lots of, uh, individual feedback or things. So, so you might have to kind of look if, if you're interested in a particular question, uh, what the answer was, or at least what I thought was a good answer. You know, you might want to look, um, uh, in, in the review here for the um, things that I post. I'll, I'll post one of these each time, mostly with just the answers for the, uh, the, the short problems that you'll be doing for the uh, quizzes or the tests. So anyway, that was kind of the breakdown of, of the grades. So everybody's doing, most everybody's doing pretty fine um, on the first test so far. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, unless some, some people ask some questions about these, I'll probably just let you guys read these. I don't really want to spend some time on these, uh, because, well, for one, most, like I said, a lot, most everybody was doing fine on them. So I don't know if we need a lot of feedback on, on them. Um, but yeah, so there, oh, the, there were, you, you only saw two questions on the test. Um, uh, but you got, there, there was three in total, so you got two of them picked at random from the three um, that were out there. So that's why you see three on this uh, feedback, uh, but you should have, you should have gotten two of these questions in your own test when you took it yourself. So, so one of them was doing a, a multi-level memory hierarchy and uh, calculating the effective access time for this hierarchy. So if you plug in the numbers like we did in um, the example videos that we had for the the first unit, uh, you'll you'll get up uh, an effective access time of about 480 
thousand nanoseconds here, right? So, so that's that's quite a bit of a hit. You know, it's only twenty nanoseconds for the cache, but you know, and in this case, our slow disk um, access. You know, so so we had a ninety. Um, 9%, 10% split between cash and not in cash. Uh, but if it was not in cash, you know, 60% of the time it was going to be main memory, but 40% of the time you're going to be forced to go over to the real s slow disk here. So this is um, extremely, you know, this is millions of times uh, slower effectively than um, accessing it from memory. So, so that's why you end up with uh, such a effect um, on your effective uh, uh, access time in this system here. So. Um, So the second question was supposed to be kind of maybe similar to the hypothetical machine. So anyway, just some, some general ideas about um, um, if, you, if you got this question, um, do you know sort of what it means to be a 32-bit architecture and what implications does that have for your instruction register and, and um, um, yeah, you know, so, so given this idea that you've got one byte as the opcode, um, and then the re remainder is your, your operand and that kind of thing. So, um, and then, yeah, the third question was, um, that you might have gotten, um, was about, um, uh, was, is really about kind of interrupts. So, uh, we didn't talk a lot about this in the videos, but um, uh, our textbook had a whole section about um, interrupt. So just checking that you kind of like read those sections and, and were familiar with interrupt processing, you know, what it means to use those versus using kind of polling to get data um, out of a system. So. All right. So yeah, let me know if, if you know, before I move on here, if, if um, anybody wanted to specifically ask something about uh, the questions on the first test or anything. So. so um, if not, I think I'll probably spend most of my time and, and I might not, might not take up a lot of time here today unless we get some questions. Um, but uh, I did want to review one or two things about the first program assignment. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, you know, I don't have too many students on the help session today, but um, um, you know, we do go over. Um, you know, and, and I will do this for the second assignment as well, you know, so I'll do more than just kind of talk about it. Um, um, uh, we'll probably do a few things and get you started. So yeah, I was a bit surprised at the number of people that, that even had a error on the very first task function because we had essentially worked that in one of the help sessions and, and given that to everybody, right? So there, there was really no reason not to, to had this assignment working through the first task since you were given that. All you had to do was watch kind of the help session. So, anyway. Um, I bring up Visual Studio here. Actually, let me bring up a terminal. There's a couple things that I, I kind of wanted to talk about on this assignment, just because it'll be useful for the rest of the assignments and simulations. Let me go ahead and rebuild this.
I know one thing um, that I gave some general feedback to. So, I mean, it's understandable that, you know, people haven't used unit test frameworks like this before, although these are, you know, um, these are pretty industry standard or, 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 or standard in, in lots of areas, um, um, scientific computing, um, uh, industry software engineering where you know people aren't just uh, using kind of uh, an IDE and a build system you know so they'll have all kinds of stuff around a system that's being developed so including a test framework maybe a continuous integration framework um, lots of stuff like that so it's kind of a secondary goal of this course you know not only operating systems and kind of developing software in a Unix environment but um, kind of uh, some familiarity with some of these industry standard things, you know, so uh, build systems and testing frameworks and things like that. Um, So I, I was bringing that up because I should have brought up the tests here first. So all the all the value all the things in the assignment dash test files are basically going to be unit tests. Okay, and so that'll be the first stuff that you'll do for your assignment um, is is get these unit tests passing. So um, and that'll be true for all the assignments um, after this one. Um, and you really, you know, you really should do these in the order given in the assignment descriptions because a lot of the times the, the, the tasks or the functions afterwards depend on the, the previous functions being implemented correctly, right? So what that kind of means is that, you know, if, if you didn't have your initialized memory working and you weren't getting all the test passed, but you went ahead and uh, wrote code for some of these other things, you might not have gotten as many points as you would have gotten if you had just gotten initialized memory to, to work 100% correctly. Because, um, you know, things after initialized memory use initialized memory. And if it's not working, you're going to be failing tests. And, and I can't really evaluate how your, you know, the, the, the work that you did. Uh, be, because you don't have um, the, the things that they depend on working correctly, right? So, so it makes it tough for me to evaluate. I can only look at the code and, and, and um, um, you know, evaluate it in my head or simulate it in my head instead of on the test, you know. So, so if you really want to get the full um, credit, you need to, to make certain that the, the uh, tests, the, the unit tests pass, um, and, and you don't want to move on to the next unit test or the next task until you get the, the current one passing. Right? So another thing that, that is good to be aware of, so if you do like a make, not make run, make, make tests. Um, so you want to see that all these tests are passing, right? Um, so it is possible if you run these tests, and you can run these by hand as well from the command line or from here. So um, once you have this compiled, uh, you should be able to, to compile and run also from Visual Studio. So Control Shift T should run the tests. But your goal um, is to, you know, at least at the end of your assignment, to have it so that when you run the tests, uh, you see that all these tests um, uh, passed here, right? Um, So if you run the unit tests and you don't get a message about the number of tests passing and failing, then something's not right. Uh, so, so it is possible that you have something in your code that's causing um, the code to crash or is causing it to exit, you know, like, like maybe an exception's being thrown or something like that. And in that case, maybe not all the tests will get run and you won't get down to the point where it, um, 
where it uh, gives the final report of, of the number of tests that pass, the number of tests that fail, right? So the simplest case, and I didn't really take off any for, for people that did this, but um, in this first assignment, some people misinterpreted the no op instruction when you executed it to mean to, that you had to exit like immediately. So if we go down here to the execute, so some people had an equivalent of something like calling exit here, right? Oops. Um, so what that does though is that it, um, if you hit an exit like this, the same as if you were, if your program was crashing with like a, 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 um, a seg fault or, or an abort or was hitting an exception. Um, so what will happen when you run the unit test is it, it may not get all the way to the, to the end and, and report the, 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 the tests that are passing and failing. Okay. But, um, so you need to be aware of that. So you, it, it, the, all the tests should always be running and it should always get to the end and get, be giving you this report. Uh, and, you know, so it, not necessarily all your tests will be passing like, like we have here on, this is the solution that I had posted. So for example, if you did have an exit in here, um, you would get something like, um, so if we rebuild that, And if you run it, um, you'll see from inside Visual Studio, you see it looks like it runs the test, but, but you don't get any output, right? And like I said, some people not familiar with this maybe didn't even realize that there was a, an issue going on here, right? So same thing if, if you run it from a regular terminal, you know, you get no output, but, but um, that's um, not, not what you want to see happening when you run your unit tests. Okay. Another flag that's useful. Um, there, there's this, uh, I want to talk, I wanted to talk a little bit in this help session about command line programs here. So this is a good example. So when you build your program with this unit test framework here, if you, if you look carefully, this, this catch.hpp um, framework that we're using, um, we define this catch config main, so it actually provides its own main function for us. That's why, why if you look in here, we don't actually have a main function. We just have test cases. Um, and that main function uh, implements a, a standard uh, command line um, tool, right? Including flags and stuff. So you can ask for help by giving like a dash H flag, I think it's dash H. Right, so most command line tools that you run from from a command line a Unix command line like this um, accept flags like these with with a single dash. Right, uh, often flags have short versions and long versions, so you can use either single dash h or or double dash help um, if you want to get help, for example. Right, so um, I was bringing up the help. Um, because um, I wanted to show there's this S flag. So right now it's a little bit tough. I mean, it seems like nothing's happening if, if we have that exit in there because uh, while running the tests, it gets to some point where it hits a no op instruction running a simulation and it just exits and it never gets the chance, the, the, the unit test framework never gets the chance to get to the point where it can output the summary results of the failing and successful tests, right? So the, this dash S flag can be useful or the dash dash, dash success flag um, to get more information. So, so this will just print out all the tests that, as they're running. So not just the failing tests, right? That helps us here because we're not failing any tests. So, so it's a little bit tough to see what we had run, um, how far we had gotten in our testing. So if I ask for dash S to see all my successful tests, 
um, uh, you'll see you get a lot more output, right? And I think I showed this trick before. Um, I like to, um, to use the use color flag because that outputs um, um, these color codes that you can pipe into a pager like less. Um, so you can kind of see them here, but then less also has a flag, the dash R, the raw flag. So now uh, if, if you do that, in fact, I often just make an alias of this. Uh, so T to, to run this test, use the color and then pipe this into the pager, right? Um, so now I can run my test, but um, instead of having to use the scroll bar here, I can use my pager, I can use the up and down arrow key, right? So in this case, when I do the dash S flag, I get all my successful ta tests. Um, but that is mainly, is useful in this case because I can go down here and see that it the last test it ran was the test on line 790. Um, I'm sorry, it was the test on line 49 of the test, the unit test file here. So where was that? So you know, um, again, I, I mean, I know where that was because we're um, because I added in that exit here for this example, but if, if we look at our tests here, um, it's getting down to line 49 here, which is close to the end. Um, but uh, 49 was the test, um, well, it actually got to this one, but, but here, it actually stopped here because this is the, the place where we fetched and tried to execute the no op. So when, as soon as we did this execute, it ran the, the version here. Um, and um, it got down to the switch statement, it hit the exit um, command that I had uh, put into the code here. So, so yeah, but, but yeah, it basically it got to this point and, and then no further. And, and so we didn't get the expected output of the number of passing and failing tests, which, which we really need. So, so like I said, I, I, I didn't really, you know, take off for that, but, but in general, kind of in future, uh, so you should be, re you should realize or be aware that you should always be getting a report of your successful and failing tests when, when you run the unit tests. Um, and if you're not, that means that, um, you know, like I was doing here, it means that, that your code is exiting or uh, is, is having some sort of a, um, an, an error or segmentation fault in the middle of it before it can get to the final summary and report of the test results, right? So, but, but yeah, if, if you build it, um, and if you're having some trouble seeing that, you might want to go use a regular terminal and, and run the tests with the dash S. So like that'll give you more information of, of exactly where you got to uh, the last last test that you ran and, and succeeded on um, before your test suite stopped running, right? Although now it's running everything again because I removed that exit. So. Um, Okay, uh, another thing that I want to point out here, so um, I didn't want to talk about this today, and I might talk about it some more, but uh, in future assignments, um, we're going to be using the other, the, there's, there's another file in here called assignment1sim.cpp, right? Um, and this, if you look in there, actually has a main function, okay? So this is an example of ourself um, uh, building a tool that's meant to run from a command line. So in this case, our, our simulator, um, and, and, and remember, I've talked about this before. So when you do a build, so like if I make a change here and save that and rebuild, you'll see that it rebuilds the assignment one send.cpp and it links that together into an execute 
executable called sim, okay? So by default, all of the assignments that you're going to be working on, we actually create two outputs, two executables. There's the, the test executable that runs the, you know, for doing the unit tests, for getting the assignment working, and then there's the sim executable, which is the actual simulator that we're trying to build for the assignments for our class here. Right? So in this case, our, our simulator is an example of doing some command line argument parsing, okay? So um, if you've never uh, known what these arguments do, or if you've never seen these before, so main is a function in C, just like any other function, and, and you can actually pass in some parameters to it, but these parameters, so remember main is, is special, it, um, it is called by the operating system. So it's gonna be the first function called when you run a, a program, um, in an operating system like like Windows or Linux, like we're doing here, Unix. So there, there's a way that you can pass in these arguments. So arg, arg C is just the argument count. It's the number of arguments that were given to the command on the command line. And then arg V are character pointers, but these are actually strings. So these are old style uh, car stars or old style character arrays, right? But we can use that to get the command line arguments. So in this case, uh, for our first assignment, we were expecting um, our simulator, um, which was the hypothetical machine simulator, to take two parameters, exactly two parameters. So the number of cycles, max cycles, and then the name of a, a file, a simulator file um, that, that we want to run, right? So again, these are like um, the, um, these are all in sim files. So for all the assignments, there'll be a sim files directory with, with, with files for these simulators, right? So like program one sim, or um, as I think I talked about before, like we could look at this program P problem set zero one sim. This is the actual problem set, uh, the, the actual um, pr problem you were given for the problem set, um, for our first problem set. The first question from our first problem set was this um, problem here, where we started the program counter at 300 and we had these contents of memory, right? Um, So when you um, build the simulator, um, so and in future assignments, you'll have to actually add some stuff to, to get the full simulation working. Um, so what we call the full system tests. Okay? But what it comes down to is that um, if you look in your directory, you know, that there's not only the test that, that we were using, uh, that you were using in this first assignment to uh, get all of the parts of the simulation working, all, all the member functions working, but there's the sim function as well. And you can run it. So if we call sim, if we don't give any um, parameters, it gives a usage message, which is um, you know, typical for these kinds of command line tools um, that, that we use from, from a terminal like this. Uh, but yeah, this is basically telling us that you know after the name of the program, we have to give two parameters: the max cycles and the and the the name of the simulator file to run. Right. So so we can do that. So we can give if we want to run for a maximum of 100 cycles, we pass that as the first parameter, um, and then we give the the sim file uh, which was in the sim files directory. Um, like program problem set zero one dot sim, okay. So here, what's happening? Um, if if you were to go through and 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 step through like with a debugger, when we call sim, it will come in here and then arg c will be set to three. Right, so why three? Well, because it, it counts the name of the program as one of the arguments in the argument count. So there's actually three parameters here on the command line. The, and the program name will always be the first one or however you invoke the program. And then the other arguments will be argument one, argument two, okay? 
Uh, that's what the ARD count is. Um, and then, so ARDV zero, so, so this is, you know, ARDV, you can think of this as just um, a, 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 an array, a, a car star array, um, so an old style array of characters. So ARDV zero will actually hold the name of the program. So if we were to access ARDV zero, it would be dot slash sim. But ARDV one will be the first command line argument, and ARDV two will be the second command line argument. So that's what we're kind of parsing uh, here. If, if you look in this um, assignment one sim.cpp, so um, argv1, we use ASCII to integer because we're expecting an integer value, which is the max cycles. So, so we pull that out of argv1. And we're, we're expecting the name of a file that we can open up as argv2. And, and so we just pull that out of argv2 and put it into a, a C++ string um, object here. And then at the end, you know, we're calling load program, which was given to you, but we're also calling the run simulation, which uses, both of these use the functions that you implemented in this assignment from translate, um, for, from um, initialized memory to your execute function and, and, and all the execute sub functions, execute add, subtract, and all that stuff to, to, to run the simulation. <coughs> so what that means is that, um, I mean, this is the ultimate product that we're building is the simulator. So here we've got our hypothetical machine simulator that we can run on programs that are in the right format in these .sim files. So if you run that, maybe pipe that out to less, you'll see that, um, again, if we look at the, the program or if you remember back to it there's there's really just three instructions so there's going to be just three fetch execute instructions so we start with a one which was a, a load from 941 I think and then a five like an add and then we store the result back out if I remember right um, so we should see that so, so we've got those three instructions in memory so our, for our first fetch we end up fetching the 1941 um, um, and, and so we end up with um, one load in our opcode and 941 in the address register here. And then executing this, we should end up loading um, the value two from 941 into the accumulator. So this was actually after the execute. So the, the fetch, we only had fetched the 1941 into the instruction register and then we executed it. And then in our next cycle, um, oh, and the program counter got incremented to 301. So again, you know, if, if you run this yourself on, on your implementation, this should be working, right? Um, if, if you got all of the, the parts of the first assignment done correctly. So, so the next one we, we fetch from 301, that gives the 5940 in there. So five is an add, so we're gonna be adding to the accumulator the value at, it, at address 940, so that gives us a five as a result result of back out the accumulator. And then we fetch one more, which was like a store. So we end up putting the five back out to 941. And then at cycle four, uh, the program current counter is, is at uh, uh, 303. There's no address out there. So that uh, memory gets initialized to zero by default if you were implementing an initialized memory correctly. So that's a no op instruction. And the program halts at that point. Um, all right, so um, kind of just to wrap up with that, we'll, we'll talk more about those. So, so in the future, you know, I mean, you'll do more than just um, implement the, get the unit test pass, and you'll have to do maybe a few extra things to also get the, the full simulation working, right, um, afterwards. So, so when you run um, the tests inside of, um, of um, Visual Studio Code, it only runs the unit tests. So it's only doing a make unit tests. Right, there's also a make system tests. And again, all assignments will have this, okay? So a system test basically 
Uh, I mean, you're free to look in the, it, it's, it's running a script in this case. And the script basically calls, so just to give you an idea of how this works, the, the script basically is calling the simulation on um, program one. So it's basically for, for, for the first system test, it calls the simulation for some number of cycles on sim files program 01.sim, right? And then it captures the output of this to a file, right? So, so in this case, this is known as, as redirection, IO redirection. So we took the result of running the simulation and put, put it into a, a file called out.text. So if you look at out.text, um, it's just the output from running our simulation on program one, okay? And then what it basically does is it, is it does a diff. So it, it does a difference between out.text and um, if you look in program, if you look in the sim files for every um, for every sim, there's a there's a dot result file, which is the the the, the correct expected output. Um, right, so we can open that up as well. So for program one sim, the result should look like this. So so this was just a capture of the output, but this is the expected output, right? And if there's no difference between the output that your program generates and what's considered the correct output, then your um, system test will pass, right? And diff gives no, it doesn't display, it. If, if they're exactly the same, it'll give no output. Only if there's a, if there's a difference, will display the differences between the two files. So, so that's basically what the, um, the system tests are doing when we run those, right? All right, anyway, yeah, so like I said, we'll probably talk more about those because there's a couple of things in there, you know, there's there's the idea of command line programs, um, you know, and that's what we're basically building in all these simulations for this class um, and passing in command line arguments and, 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 and using um, commands from the command line and kind of how this all works inside of a, a Linux uh, command line ecosystem. So all kinds of things that I'm hoping people will become familiar with from using these assignments. So, but what I wanted people to, to be, to just point out at this point is, is that, um, you know, that, that, that you should be aware that, that what we're really doing for all these simulations is that, that ultimate output, that the ultimate thing we're creating is this dot sim, is, is the sim executable, which, which is a simulation of some aspect of the operating system, right? So we'll we'll spend more time with with the with the overall simulation later for our, our later assignments where we do memory management and um, you know um, um, job scheduling and things like that. So. All right. Um, Anybody have any questions? Because I'm kind of, it was most of the stuff I kind of wanted to mention. Remember about the program one here. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I didn't go through it step by step. The example solution here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be happy if anybody had a question about a particular function, you know, you can send it to me or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, or of course, you can look at the example solution. So, kind of real quickly. Um, I'll just go through these one by one. So, 
So yeah, your first one was initialized memory, but this might have been kind of one of the biggest ones once you get everything done in here. Although really to get the, the first test passing, all you needed was this part correct. So initializing the member variables, right? Um, so most of these functions, besides maybe having to have a, um, a condition statement to check and throw a, an exception, we're usually one or two line kinds of functions. So, you know, the heart of translate address is just to take the, the sim address, subtract the base address out, and that will give you the, uh, you know, that this is basically a translation from the virtual address of the simulation to a real address, which is an index um, into our memory, um, uh, you know, to our memory array that, that we use to simulate memory here. So we'll talk more about, um, memory address translation and virtual address spaces versus real address spaces and things like that later in the class. Um, peek and poke, you should have been reusing that translate address. Um, so if you're reusing that, you could have done these as one liners basically if you wanted to, but I have missed kind of two liners here with a, with a temporary, you know, with a, a local variable to, to get the real address from the virtual simulation address and then use that to either write into memory or read the value out of memory and, and return it. Um, and then fetch is a fairly simple, um, if you understand what's, what the simulator is doing. So given our program counter um, and, and reusing peak address, you know, we, we can use that to um, see where the pro program counter is pointing to. Um, and, and read that out of memory and, and load it into the instruction register. That's basically what a fetch is, right? Peak, peak memory, wherever the program, program counter is really a pointer in this case, it holds a memory address. So, so we take that memory address and we load the value into our instruction register. That's the first part of our fetch execute cycle and then execute. Um, so this is typical, you know, this is, um, this is, you can think of this as high level pseudocode for what a, a CPU or what a chip would be doing for the actual execute of instructions on the chip. So you first have to kind of translate the address. So you would probably do some things on the instruction register to pull it apart, um, to get the things that represent the opcode and then to get the other things that represent, in this case, our memory uh, references that we need to do. So real, real instructions will be more complicated. They'll have more things than just you know, like the op code and the memory, but, and then there's going to be something that that's basically a big branch. So whatever the instruction is that needs to be executed, we have to go to, you know, to different parts of the logic of the CPU circuit um, that implement those particular instructions. So in our case, it's just load, store, jump, and subtract. So yeah, so, so load is just also reusing your peak address um, as is store um, reusing your um, poke address. And uh, add and subtract should be reusing your peak and poke address and then just performing the indicated arithmetic operator and storing the results back in the accumulator. Um, and then jump was, um, uh, maybe the simplest of all. So whatever the instruction was that was translated, that should be just uh, instead of poked back into memory, saved back into memory, should be poked into the program counter. So it becomes the next um, location that we um, um, that we fetch from for the next fetch execute cycle. All right, yeah, so, so um, like I said, again, if you have any questions about the assignment three, a, a particular one of those functions, let me know. So, um, but yeah, I'll give you guys, if you have a, a last kind of, a last chance here, if there's any questions for the people that were here in the session. Uh, if not, I'm probably gonna go ahead and we'll stop that here for today then. So, 
probably next time we'll talk about our next assignment and also the problem set. So uh, probably we'll start with the problem set next time. Um, we'll see if people have questions about it. So, okay, that's it for this session. I will see you guys then on Wednesday.